Good morning, everybody, and uh, I must say it's a privilege to be here. Um, I was given only 30 minutes, and I must say that's a challenge because talking about uh, price volatility and also about tools to deal with that is a very exciting and interesting topic, and to reduce that into 30 minutes will be a challenge, but I'll do my, my utmost. Um, and I start with a bit of an unusual approach uh, to my presentation, because if you say you want to uh, tackle price volatility, I think you have to ask yourself first, why should I bother? Why is, it, why is it relevant for me? And if we look a little bit at the milk prices that we've seen, and this is a graph that the European Commission presents um, uh, every month, it shows you uh, the blue line is the milk price paid on average by the EU dairies. And the red line is a milk price calculated based on skim milk powder prices and, bu and uh, butter prices. And I think you can make a first observation is that, okay, yes, indeed, we've been uh, talking a lot about volatility and it has been very, very important, that volatility. But if we look at the, the commodity milk price and we look at the actual price paid um, uh, to the farmer, hmm, that volatility is not that, that extreme. And you see a little bit of that happening uh, over the last couple of years. And what is interesting is there is that you see that the milk price that theoretically can be achieved by the market, by the market meaning the red uh, price and the, and the blue line, that there seems to be a, a bit of a, a topping off uh, that's going on by the, by the dairy um, uh, processors. And so you can ask yourself, okay, if they are doing that, that's, that's a good job. And so far as a dairy farmer, uh, I, have, I have no concern. But I think you have to look critically at what's behind that, um, that process that uh, allows them to give you a, a, a price that's less volatile than what the markets are actually doing. Uh, it could be that they are basically, um, that there is a cash drain uh, as, uh, as they are giving you uh, a higher price than what the market uh, does. And so that means that the financial health of a co-op in such a period is worsening. You can ask yourself if that's a good thing for a co-op, because if you have to, you're expecting more milk and you have to, uh, you're looking at some major investments in processing capacity, I can imagine that the bank uh, that gives you the, 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 um, the credit to make that investment doesn't want your balance sheet to deteriorate. Now, there could be also other more noble reasons why you are giving a better price, because you've anticipated, uh, you've been able to forward sell. So there are a lot of reasons that lead to the fact that the milk price paid is not fully reflective of what the market dictates uh, in terms of commodities. Um, but this is the reality. And so you can look at that critically and say, in such a reality, I have no, no issues with, uh, with volatility. I don't need to tackle it. It could also be that you consider these two periods that we've had, uh, the one is in 2009 and then more recently in 2012, sure you see that, that you say, look, my model can deal with these situations. It, I have no problem. I have sufficient financial buffer. So if you come to, into a period where milk prices are low, that's not a problem for me. Um, I use up maybe some of my financial buffer in the knowledge that things will improve. Well, if you're model is like that, if you're resilient enough to deal with these periods of low prices, then I can say, look, then there is not a problem. Just run with the market. Uh, if you survive that nicely, then it's good. But if you want to make projections for the futures and you want to invest in enlarging, for instance, your farmer, enlarging your, your um, uh, processing capacity, and you need, um, you need uh, to borrow money, I think having periods of, uh, of a, uh, where you're losing cash, I think, is something you want to avoid. First of all, if you want to tackle price volatility, you would do it with hedging. And I was, delib I was thinking, uh, doubting a little bit when I prepared for this presentation, what should I bring you about the, 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 the tools or the dynamics or the mechanism behind um, um, uh, hedging, and I didn't want to go too much into the detail, I just wanted to focus on, on what is the purpose. And what you basically see, this is again the, this um, line, the orange line, that is the milk price paid by um, Irish dairies. This is um, figures again from the Commission, so it's an average of Ireland as it's being reported. And you see the blue line, and that blue line is the trend line. That, I would say it's, it's the average, it's somewhat the average, or, but it's, it gives you a trend. You see that milk prices overall uh, between 2008 and 2012 are an upward trend. Now, what can you achieve by um, uh, 
uh, tackling price volatility is that you basically try to narrow the band within which your milk, pli your milk price fluctuates around that trend line. That is the true purpose. It is very important that hedging is not made to improve your milk price. That will never happen. What it does, it makes sure that the volatility, the swings, the extremes are taken out uh, of, of the milk price and you try to get as close as possible to the trend line. And I think of you, uh, it's important to point out this trend line, this blue dotted line, because that's going to be the basis of the analysis that I make in the, in the next slides. I nonetheless want to give you a brief overview of what is available today uh, as futures and options. Um, we see today, um, everybody is aware that since 2007, the dairy sector, especially in Europe, has encountered a lot of volatility. Before that, we had a period where prices were relatively stable. That was also the period where we had significant public stocks, and that helped keep the prices within a very narrow range. But um, we, um, the European taxpayer uh, the, and, and then the Parliament and the Council decide that that's a very expensive tool to keep uh, prices uh, stable. And so we're abandoning basically the, the whole principle of having large stocks. And certainly in 2007, what happened? Public stocks in the EU, public stocks in the US, they disappeared. And we got more volatility. And with that, we saw the arrival of um, uh, futures. Um, first, there was the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Uh, as was mentioned in the beginning. They've been around already uh, much longer because volatility was uh, much stronger in the US market than it was in the EU market. But also now you have in Europe, you have Eurex and you have Live, and in New Zealand you have NZX that have um, uh, several contracts. And you have two types of contracts, contracts with physical delivery. That means that if you have bought on the futures or you have sold on the futures and you still have that position when the contract uh, is expiring, you actually will receive or have to uh, deliver the goods under that contract. Contrary to that are the cash settled uh, uh, contracts, whereby you're not, ne you're not really buying product, but you're par uh, buying a, a volume of product against the price reference. And when your contract expires, is that expiration date, then the actual price of the market is compared with your futures price, and you can have either that you have to pay money to the exchange or that you will receive money to the exchange depending on how your uh, future contract relates to the actual spot market. That's very important. Now if you look at the overview of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, you see that most of the uh, contracts are blue. That means that they are cash settled. Uh, you have a couple of con you have one real future contract, the international skim milk powder uh, future, which is uh, with physical delivery, but it's hardly trading. Uh, you have a couple of spot calls that's not really futures, but they help feed the futures market. But you see in the United States that you have um, a whole number of cash settled futures. Important is you have two milk futures, and I will come back on that more. You have the class three milk and the class four milk. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but class four milk is a milk price derived on the butter and the skim milk powder price in the US market. The class three uh, uh, price is um, more a cheese based milk price whereby cheddar, uh, the cheddar um, cheese in the United States in combination with whey and in combination with a little bit of butter is determining the milk price. And it doesn't surprise you probably that while you have the milk futures that you also have the underlying um, commodities that fuel those, uh, those milk futures that are also being traded in, uh, in Chicago. If we look at the other exchanges, you see that it's a bit different. In Eurex in Frankfurt, you have a butter, a skimmel powder, and since I think about uh, a year also a whey powder future, but nothing relates to milk. In New Zealand, you have whole milk powder, butter oil, and skimmel powder future. Again, only the commodities, nothing that relates to a milk price. So that is very important. There is one physical delivery contract in, uh, in London, uh, a skimmel powder contract, but it's not trading at all. And of course, there are what we call the OTC, the over-the-counter contracts. That means that if these contracts, which are all very standardized, if your needs are different than what the standardized contracts offer, you can look for a partner at the uh, over-the-counter market. Uh, again, this is some um, explanation about uh, what is a contract with physical delivery. Is this the, the right presentation? And I thought I had eliminated that for time uh, purposes. So that's, uh, not so important. How do futures work? That's the next slide that I wanted to uh, present. I have to go ahead. So once again, 
I have uh, looked for my presentation at the milk uh, price, even though most of the futures that are traded are the commodities. But why did I do that? Because milk can be compound, com composed out of the commodities. And similar to the class 4 and the class 3 milk prices, you can have a formula based on the commodities that takes skim milk powder price and butter price, that takes into consideration a cost to produce it, and that takes also into consideration how much of that skim milk comes into the milk, how much of, uh, how much of that butter goes into the milk, and that's how you can make a, a butter and skim milk powder commodity price. A similar procedure for cheddar, where it is a bit more complicated because you're not only using cheddar, you're also using whey, and because the, con the fat content of, of uh, cheddar is different than that of the milk, you also have a, a small butter fat component. Now, what happens in, uh, in a futures market? Here you see the, and use the skimmel powder price as it goes from 2008 to 2013. And this is the reality of, of the market. Um, I just, I think you used the old presentation, is that possible? Uh, here. I'll use that. I've, I've shortened my presentation because the first one I made was uh, over an hour, and since I have only 30 minutes, but it, it would appear that that's the one. So I'll, I'll try to go over some slides a bit more quicker, uh, quicker than, uh, than I planned. But what you see here is that the red line is the milk price based on the skim milk powder and the butter price. The dotted orange line is the trend line. And what normally happens in a futures market, if there is sufficient uh, volume being traded, is that at a certain moment, you will see the futures, eh, let's say that today is here, um, that the futures price will gradually converge to the trend line. Why is that? Well, today we have very high prices. So you can have a very good estimate that mm, maybe in a month's time, milk price will still be high, higher than the trend line. But if you go six months or 12 months further, what will be the price? And therefore, the only good tool or the good reference that you have is the historical data. So futures tend to evolve over time. If you look at the, the prices that are being traded at the futures market, you have the short-term contracts are very much reflective of today's market reality. The, the contracts that are traded further down uh, the line go uh, more to the historical trend of the, of the, of the market. I, gave you an ex uh, I made an example uh, with some figures whereby you would uh, trade, um, and that's an example that fictitious, let's say that we are today, February 2011. And we want today, we want to hedge November 2012. That's very ambitious. That means that you can already hedge 18 months, more than 18 months down the road. Uh, what can you do? And we look, I looked at, at then the actual prices that were realized in that period. You, let's say you sold uh, five tons of butter, one contract at Eurex, at the price of 364 euros per 100 kilo, and you sold 10 tons of skimmel powder at the price of 238. That equivalents to roughly 115,000 uh, kilo of milk at a price of 33.90. If then you come into November 2012, what do you see? First of all, the butter price is different than what you traded. The butter price moved to 340, whereas your future contract uh, that you um, sold in February 2011 was 364. <laughs> so what does that mean? You have sold uh, at 364. The actual market was 340. That means that your contract, your future contract, is in the money, as we say, and you will receive from the exchange 1,200 euros um, for that contract. However, if we did the same, with the same exercise, when we look at the skimmel powder price, there it moved in the other way. You, have ha you had sold a future at 238, but the market actually went to two, eight, uh, 282. That means that your contract is out of the money, and so you will have, at expiration, you will have to pay to the exchange. Now, if you look at the equivalent, equivalent milk price that uh, the um, butter and the skimmel powder uh, generate, you have 36 euros per 100 kilo. Let's, and then again, this is an, uh, an assumption, let's assume that the dairy pays you a price that is close to that commodity-based price of 36.20, so almost very relevant. You will be rece receiving for that um, amount of milk 41,630 euros. Now, If you then look, and that's then the continuation of that, at the total picture, 
what happened? So again, in November, in, in February 2011, you hatched November 2012. Now you're in, in uh, uh, November 2012. You sell your milk and you pay your, your dairy pays you 41,630 euros based on the 36 euro that is the current um, market price. You received from the exchange 1,200 euro for your butter contract. You pay to the exchange 4,400 euro for your skim milk powder contract. You, the balance is that you've received 38,000 euros. That gives you a milk price of 33 euros, which is actually the milk price that you hatched in February 2011. So that's the whole basic principle. And by using that principle consistently every day, every, uh, on, on a consistent basis, what would happen is if you have a perfect scenario that the milk price paid by the dairy is equivalent <coughs> to the milk price based by the commodities and you've hatched that, those commodities at the trend line, well, theoretically, you could have a, a beautiful trend line. But the reality, unfortunately, is different because the milk price that's being paid by you is not necessarily following exactly the commodity milk price. And I'll go now in the next slides in a couple of presentations where we look at the actual milk price paid in Ireland, we look at the commodity uh, price, and we look at if I would have hatched the trend line, what would be my result? It's what I call the Irish uh, case study. And so I used a couple of series. I used a series with butter and skim milk powder as the commodities that determine a milk price. I used a series with cheddar that determined the milk price. I used a series with a mix of both, and then I finally used what I call a fixed mix, where part of your milk price is fixed and part of your milk price follows, uh, uh, follows a mix of commodities.